Okay, so uh, let's start. Welcome everybody to a new Hypno Mom and Ayla podcast. It's been quite long since we did the last um, recording. And the last time we did a recording, I think it was in uh, Sean Michael Andrews hotel room in the London UK conference. And uh, well, that's so exciting because today we have Sean Michael Andrews, who is known as world's fastest hypnotist. But for me, I think uh, the term most kind, world's kindest hypnotist applies more because <laughs> I remember, Sean, that, uh, well, first of all, you gave us your hotel room, I think even presidential suite. <laughs> and then uh, I saw you with a remarkable tablet, which I also have. And you had this, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you had this uh, amazing cover because with the remarkable, which is an amazing tool, I think, as a hypnotherapist, uh, you have a pen, but uh, you don't have a. Uh, it's not stuck to the, to the remarkable, so you can lose it easily. And and then yes. you said, "Oh, I can share that with you." And uh, I think a couple of weeks later, you shared it on my mother's Facebook, and then she uh, shared it with me, and I got it in the meantime. But I thought that was so kind. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really kind because it was weeks later, and and you still remembered it, and uh, I'm very happy with that new edition. <laughs> So for me, you'll be well, world's kindest hypnotherapist. Well, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I think um, probably you can introduce yourself best, but just uh, what I know about you is that you uh, have a lot of experience with hypnosis, that you're a trainer yourself. I think you uh, trained in almost 20 countries around the world. Is that correct? Almost. 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 <laughs> so far. Yeah, I think you were I also... Really want to reach 20. Sorry? I, I said, I really want to reach 20, but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think you were collecting flags when we spoke for every country that you teach. So That's uh, correct. Yeah, I have, a, I have a flag for every country that I teach in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. So I think you have a lot of experience and yeah, I'm just very happy and honored that you're here, that we can, uh, you know, talk to you and hear your thoughts about hypnosis and the field and all. There okay. Anything? Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, I um, I, I thank you. I'm I'm, I'm honored that uh, that you invited me here. Um, it's, I guess, I guess. Well, we we share some of the same background because, of course, I you know I took the Omni course uh, with Gerald Kine back in 2005, the same as Ina, and uh, you were in the same class. No, no, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Class, but. <laughs> but but the same, but the same training. And, okay, yeah. And that's when I tell people I truly became a hypnotist. I thought I, I was a hypnotist earlier. I thought I was a hypnotist back in, I don't know, the 1980s. But uh, that was when I was doing NLP. And then when I took the Omni course, that was when I realized what true hypnosis was. And one of the things I, I've been very fortunate in that I've encountered really wonderful trainers like for instance Gerald Kine or Gil Boyne or or Bandler or Grinder and and I I just sought out the best trainers and the majority of them were very very good about sharing their knowledge and so to honor them I, that's what I try to do when I'm when I'm teaching my students I always tell them that I don't keep secrets so if 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 there's something that I know uh, I'm, I'm going to share well something appropriate <laughs> that yeah. I know. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to share it with them, and and also I learn from the students. And so if I learn something from a student, I'm going to share that too. And uh, I don't know. I, I think it's the way a trainer should be. I'm, I'm sure you. I'm sure you would agree. Very um, much. Yeah. Very <laughs> much. Yeah. You you want to give them everything that they become a success with what they do. We do not train to train. But we train so that people are enabled and have the tools they really need. Yes, that, that is so important. And you know what? You just reminded me of something that I remember Jerry saying back in 2005. He, he said, uh, don't keep chasing that next course. He said, don't you know, think, well, if I get this one more course, then I'll be able to start doing hypnotherapy. Don't do that. You've got enough right now to get out there and start helping people. 
And if you don't do it, then you may never, you may never actually use this stuff, which would be a shame. And, um, and so it, uh, now I didn't take his advice right away, <laughs> but <laughs> pretty soon after that, I started seeing clients and I don't know about you, but I think I learned more from my clients than I learned in any course that I ever took. It's when you're sitting down with a live human being and, and doing the work, oh, they teach you so much. And uh, so, yeah, it just don't keep chasing those, those courses. Just get out there and do it. Yeah, I think that's I so, so valuable what you say, because, I, yeah, we see that also that uh, uh, some students, they keep doing course after course and always hesitant to start and looking for that sort of confidence to get started. But actually, the confidence comes from doing the sessions and it's scary to do the sessions. Yes, it is. <laughs> but we put, a lot, people, we put a lot of uh, attention to that in training. So uh, we give them direct drives for their success. And um, mm -hmm. uh, we also do a lot of follow up. So when the student is finished, it's not finished. So then they can have a place to ask the questions and mm -hmm. to talk. And even we pick up the phone if necessary. And we don't have a day job with it because the training is already so good that generally people find their way very fast in a very fast way. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's it, it is a solid course. I like I say, that's how I became a hypnotist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you got me very curious, Sean, because you said that you didn't take his advice right away. So what helped you <laughs> to start? Like, how did you deal with that sort of maybe nervousness to start out? It's a good question. Um, I think, gosh, I I think it was it was this. Well, I I think it was the demonstrational hypnosis because I learned the instant inductions from Jerry and and Bob Brenner. Um, and incidentally, Bob Brenner, who used to teach the course with Jerry, is actually living in my town. He's, oh. he's living in the villages, Florida. Yeah, I haven't looked him up yet, but I, I understand that he is living here. He retired here. But I think it was in doing the demonstrational hypnosis, I got I got confident by hypnotizing lots of people. And of course, the more people you hypnotize, the more confident you feel. And when you feel super confident in your ability to put people into hypnosis, then, then you can learn the real hard stuff, which is actually being a good therapist or being a good entertainer. And um, yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, in the, in the, all the countries that I've visited to, to train him, one of the things, and Ina alluded to this earlier, one of the things I've noticed is there are a lot of hypnotists out there who are not confident that they can put people into trance. And and that, that, it sounds kind of silly, but if you think about it, you, you know it's true. They, they just, they, they, they'll, they'll have a client come in, the client sits down, they do their intake, and and then they begin the induction, but in the back of their mind, they're thinking, I hope to God this person goes into trance, you know, <laughs> which is which is kind of silly. A hypnotist worried that they're going to you know, not be able to put people into trance. And it's not just the therapist. It's the entertainers as well. The stage hypnotists, Whoa. a lot of stage hypnotists have this fear. They have this nightmare, which I don't think has ever happened, <laughs> but they have this nightmare that they're going to put. 20 people in the chairs up on stage and that they're going to do their induction and zero, like no people will go into trance. And it just, it doesn't happen, but they are, they do lack the confidence and yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. So, so. Yeah. But uh, that's yeah, the, the beauty of what we were taught by Gerald Kine, because um, if if you pay attention in class, then there are so many small gems. I always explain in class like you have different roads, for instance, to 
to quit smoking. It can be a nicotine plaster. It can be behavioral uh, talk therapy. It can be hypnosis. You have many ways. But if you take the road to hypnosis, your first goal is to bring the person into hypnosis. And I, I even draw it on the board like, like a cheap chase. Because if there is fear for the process, then it is like a big wall in front of the wall. You will not get your client into hypnosis. And we have around 20 or 30 of these small issues that do not come up with all clients. But if you want to bring 98%, because I don't believe in 100%, people decide themselves if they want to go into hypnosis. There are always 2% that will reject it consciously or subconsciously. But if you can remove all these small barriers, then you have mm -hmm. a straight road towards the goal. Yeah. yeah, well, that that's true. I mean, if, if if they have fear for the process, it's it's definitely going to be difficult. Uh, that's actually that's actually one of the beauties of my earlier training in NLP in rapport mm -hmm. building. Yeah. Because uh, when you when you can establish rapport quickly with someone, they'll do almost anything for you, and in, including going into trance for you. Mm -hmm. So, beginning when they call me on the phone or actually beginning when they go on the website. A client will go on the website and they'll find a video of me giving the three common misconceptions about hypnosis. And, and the whole time I want to convey to them that I'm, I'm, I'm a, a good person, uh, that, uh, that I'm interested in helping them and that I'm friendly and that I'm, you know, I'm not a scary person. <laughs> and and so so I'm I'm already starting to build rapport. Excuse me. And then they call me on the phone. Simple things like does the person speak very quickly or do they speak very slowly? You know, and and so I will pick, I will, I will uh, adapt my voice to their voice, my vocabulary to their vocabulary, my speed to their speed, everything, my um uh, my volume. And so I'm establishing rapport on the telephone. So by the time they meet me, we're 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 friends, and and they trust me, and they they must trust the hypnotist because mm -hmm. well I, I mean that's another thing I I did the numbers one time, and uh, I found that only five percent of my clients that came in to see me for hypnotherapy only five percent of them had ever been hypnotized before. So that's kind of scary, you know, and so they they come into the office and some of them have had very difficult lives, have had uh, bad things happen to them. So they come into my office. They've never been hypnotized before. They don't know the hypnotist. Uh, they they sit in this chair. The door is closed. The lights are dim and they're asked to close their eyes and submit to a process that they have never experienced before. So if you don't have rapport, yeah. it mm -hmm. makes it difficult to get that person into trance. So yeah. rapport building is, is essential. Yeah. And here, here's a little tip. I always set my offices up so that I am never sitting between my client and the door. They can always see the door and I'm off to the side. I just, just to make them feel more comfortable. Everything is about making the, the, the client feel comfortable and safe. And then when you have that, it makes the hypnosis so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say that rapport building is more important than using the right induction? Oh, that's a good question. Huh. Um, I, I think that if you have rapport all of your inductions would work better. Uh, and if you don't have rapport, you could run into trouble with every one of your inductions. I mean, some of the inductions, like we all use the Dave Elman induction, which is the perfect induction for, for therapy. And it's pretty effective. <laughs> but, but, you know, if your client doesn't trust you, yeah. it, it could be a problem. So yeah. um, I don't know how to answer that. I, I really, I really don't know how to answer that. They're both uh, the right induction is is so important, but having rapport is so important. 
um basically it's in yeah that's a good i don't know <laughs> basically it's in the omni training with the pre-talk which we teach builds up or or makes um 80 percent it deci decides for 80 percent if the rest of the session will go successfully and the pre-talk is all about building rapport in a way it's taking away misconception explaining hypnosis showing that you're mm -hmm. qualified that you know what you're talking about that's also mm -hmm. a lot about rapport building yeah yeah true but yeah, no. uh, but yeah, that makes a big difference if you yeah. if you just said uh, hop in a chair and jump into your induction. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's yeah. definitely the, the pre the pre brief or pre talk is yeah. is essential. Uh, yeah. I like to keep mine quick. Mine mine is mine is shorter. I've I've, I've trimmed it down over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think um, the way I teach it, it takes fifty eight seconds to do okay. it in English. <laughs> wow, brilliant. <laughs> Well, that is it, what, it, what it, we were taught by Jerry. He said, like, you could work as a dentist, sit in the chair, we do the work. But you uh -huh. have to deal with the psychology, psychological mechanisms of the client. And that's where you have mm -hmm. the pre-talk and the report building come in. But our work mm -hmm. can be done like this, if you do the pure regression. Oh, but, regression, yes. <laughs> but since your pre-talk is so short... Would you be willing uh -huh. to share it with us? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have you have your telephone? You, you want to time me? Oh, I don't have my telephone, but uh, <laughs> you we, have your phone. Uh, right, me... the... I'll use time. mine. Let me... <laughs> okay. let me let me use mine. I'll I'll uh... let's see. Where's that clock? Uh... My goodness! Oh, there it is. Okay. And stopwatch. Okay. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get start when I begin. Okay, here it goes. There are three common misconceptions about hypnosis. The first one is that there's a loss of control. There's no loss of control in hypnosis. You'd never do anything in hypnosis that you wouldn't normally do. You'd never do anything against your moral, religious, or personal values or something you just thought was silly. So when I've got you in hypnosis, if I were to say to you, "Will you stand on your head?" you would say, "No, I'm not going to do that." You wouldn't be compelled. The second common misconception about hypnosis is that people tell secrets in hypnosis, and that's not true either. If you had a secret to keep in your normal waking state, you would keep it in hypnosis. You're not going to give me the PIN number for your age. And the third common misconception is that people can get stuck in hypnosis, and that's impossible. In 4,000 years of people being hypnotized, nobody ever got stuck. However, when you're in hypnosis, it feels so good, you wish you could get stuck there. But you can't. Wow. Almost 57 seconds. <laughs> wow. You said 58 oh, seconds. <laughs> it froze. Okay. I don't, I don't know if you, you're, 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 there we go. I got you back. Okay. So, so yeah, it was, oh, it was yeah. Wow. 56 and 35. So almost 57 seconds. So I was a little fast this morning, but anyway, That's but the whole time really I'm into doing your, into your brand, like the fastest hypnotist. Also the fastest. Yeah, pre that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. If I had the world's slowest pre-talk, that wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, um, the, and the whole time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the client, you know, you make the little joke about getting the pin number, or you make the, you tell them that, um, you know, when you're in hypnosis, pre uh, presupposition is that you are going to go in hypnosis when you're in hypnosis it will feel so good you're going to wish you could get stuck there but yeah. you can't and and so the whole thing that's that's building rapport as well with the client and uh yeah so so it takes a minute and i use the same pre-talk when i'm doing um, hypnotherapy and when i'm doing demonstrations and giving talks and when i'm doing hypnosis shows um, I, the same pre-talk and, um, yeah, it's, it's quick. And, um, and, and, and those, I mean, there are, there are lots of misconceptions about hypnosis, right? Not just three, but, yeah. but yeah. I don't want to bring, I don't want to bring those up. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to put ideas in her head, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I was present <laughs> at your, uh, hypnosis show in Las Vegas and oh. uh, yeah. And what I was know this at, at the, 
was this in the in the casino with the um with the the conference it was during the hypno thoughts we went okay, to another so place it was, it was it was part of, oh it was another place it was not in the hotel where the conference was no we oh went... okay so you you saw my worst show ever well that's good <laughs> <laughs> Wow, if that is your worst show, then how amazing would be your best show? <laughs> so uh, I, I really well, enjoyed well, thank it. thank you. Yeah, no, I really oh, enjoyed thank you. it. Thank and you. what I want to say about it, uh, basically there are two types of shows, the ones that cringe your finger, I don't know the English expression, oh. and the ones that are making fun, but not making fun of people. So that are with honor, with dignity. And I, uh, we have a colleague here in the Netherlands who does it similarly. But uh, I've seen colleagues that they drop women on stage where you can write, look under the, uh, uh, how do you say that, under their skirts and don't mind a thing. Uh, and um, oh. yeah, so I really commend you for the very beautiful way because I think it's a bit um, strange that you have hypnosis as therapy and you have also the stage which is not done by psychologists and doctors and everything. So, yeah. uh, and, and you, you put it on a, in a way that it is educational, that people start understanding the power of their mind in a, a way that you can have fun without making fun of people. So really good well thank you you know i, I yeah. thank you i appreciate it yeah i, I don't i don't want to embarrass people of yeah. course and, and of course as you said i do a clean show so uh, yeah. they will never allow me back in las vegas mm -hmm. because uh, they don't do clean shows in vegas they do only <laughs> only adult shows and i don't uh, do that kind of a show yeah 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 you know it's it's funny though um when uh when I took uh, the Omni, I keep talking about the Omni class, but you don't mind that. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> when when I took the Omni class, um, Jerry Kine talked a lot about stage. And I thought, I don't like that stuff. You know, I, I thought that should, we should not have stage hypnosis. That's a bad thing. <laughs> and they should outlaw that. Yeah. And uh, And then a few years later, I was doing it. So that was kind of funny. But you you, <laughs> you found your own dignified way in it, and uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. I, I I enjoy it. I've got a sh I've got a show coming up in uh, July twelfth. So. <laughs> oh, we'll just miss it. <laughs> we will fly yeah. in nineteenth of July. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but what what uh, then? That's interesting that you say that uh, you you thought it should be outlawed hypnosis shows and yes. what led you then to become also a show hypnotist i think i think it was um it was sort of a, it was sort of like a wedge you know first of all i started doing street hypnosis which was really good for me because it it gave me the opportunity to practice and hypnotize many many people you know a, um when you're doing street hypnosis you can go out on the street and you can hypnotize 20 people in a, about an hour maybe two hours and but if you have and if you have a thriving hypnotherapy practice you're probably not going to do any more than five or six people in a day so so if you're doing street hypnosis you get to practice your your induction and your deepeners many many times and you get really good at it and i enjoyed that and then one of my um one of my friends had a show schedule and she asked me if I would do it with her. This is my friend, my friend Kenda Summers. And I said, well, okay. It was a, it was a show at a, um, at a fair, uh, you know, and I did it and, and I didn't want to do it. But when I got up there and just to be on stage and play with the people and show the power of hypnosis, and I found that I really enjoyed it. So after that, you know, I started, I started doing, uh, started doing show. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The one in Las Vegas that you saw, Ina, that wasn't my worst show, my worst show. <laughs> Tell us about your worst show. That's always fun to hear. <laughs> my worst show. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of my friends was a stage hypnotist and he uh, was double booked. He had two jobs and one of them was a really good job. <laughs> and then there was this other job that he didn't want to do. 
And it was it was on a uh, a small ship, a small cruise ship that just went around Baltimore Harbor. And it was called the event was called Wine, Women and Song. And so he said, it's just going to be you on the ship with a bunch of women. And uh, and I thought that that sounds that sounds really weird. I'm going to be the only guy. Well, I wasn't the only guy. There were there was there were two other guys on the ship. But anyway, it was it was a couple hundred women. And uh, so I talked to the guy. We sat in on the ship in the dock in Annapolis, Maryland. And I said, so what happens? They do this every year. And he said, oh, yeah, every year I do it. And I said, so what's it like? And he said, well, they'll be here in about half an hour. And he said, first of all, they'll be drunk. And I I looked at my watch and it was it was 10 o'clock in the morning. And I said, how are they going to be drunk? He said, they go to the um, to the, the the restaurants and bars in Annapolis and they drink mimosas. You know, it's I guess it's orange juice and champagne. They drink those. Yeah. And so they're dr- they're drunk when they get on the ship. And he said, and then then they have the wine on the ship. I thought, oh, this is not going to be good. This is really <laughs> this is going to be not good anyway. So so my committee was was pretty pretty drunk yes and it was uh it was an, an unusual show um but and 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 it was but it was my usual show my usual clean show and um but it it was hard working with i had about 10 people on the 10 women on the stage and they didn't want to follow instructions very well but they did go into hypnosis very quickly that's that's something that they there have been scientific studies that have shown that uh alcohol a lot of alcohol definitely uh enhances trance okay. it definitely gets you a deeper trance um but what it doesn't get you is the ability to follow suggestions it doesn't get you that <laughs> so so yeah it was it was a it was a pretty weird show but that was probably my worst show that was you know. wow uh-huh. that's a really funny story i remember mm-hmm. in uh, london you told also in your uh, presentation about um, you experimenting with people drinking alcohol and giving suggestions and that you were able to, but this yes. was before that experimentation. <laughs> this right, was... it was before that experiment. Yeah, I think the original experiment was done at, uh, is it Leeds University or University of Leeds? I'm not sure how they do it, but it was a, a UK college uh, or um, university. And they uh, they found that students, after they gave them several pints of beer, uh, went into hypnosis so much deeper and so much uh, so 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 quickly, and so we tr- we decided to duplicate that experiment in Heidelberg, and uh, yes, it was uh, it they we first we hypnotized them and uh, and then asked them how deep they were. Because they were all somnambulists and they would say, yeah, six on a scale, one to 10. Yeah. And then we had them drink. And then uh, the ones that drank wine went into a much deeper trance than the ones that drank water. But here is, oh God, yet another reference back to Jerry Kine. This is so funny <laughs> because Jerry, Jerry told this story one time. And honestly, I didn't believe it. He said, I used to, I go, used to go to the bars at two o'clock when the bars close and I would hypnotize the the men and make them sober so they could drive home. And I thought that's not going to work. That, that is how that cannot work. Anyway, I had these, these three, three ladies and they were very drunk and, and they could hardly stand up. One of them could hardly sit in her chair. And, and, and so and they talked that when they talked, they slurred their words. They were drunk. By the way, in case anybody's wondering, uh, we we all stayed there. You know, Stephanie and I, you know, brought coffee and and food and everything. And we did not let them leave until they had sobered up. So they were, you know, but anyway. Yeah. So so I have these three drunk ladies and and I decided to try Gerald Kine's uh, suggestion. And I said, in a moment, I'm going to snap my fingers. And when I do, uh, you will be completely sober. And I went, and two of them stayed drunk. And But the other one, this one lady, I remember her name was Maria. She suddenly became sober. 
She could speak clearly. She could walk across the room, whereas she couldn't. She was holding onto the doorway to hold herself up. Now she could walk across the room and she could speak clearly and she was absolutely sober. It was, it was one, of the, one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in hypnosis. And I thought, wow, Jerry, Jerry was right. And, um, but then she said, but, you know, it was more fun when I was drunk. And so I said, <laughs> and she was, drunk, she was drunk again. <laughs> but yes, that was, that was incredible. So, wow. yeah. so what other incredible things have you witnessed? Because you have so much experience. Like when you just spoke about the 80s, I'm thinking that's when I was born. And you were already hypnotizing. <laughs> So you must have so much experience. What are like some of the most remarkable things you have witnessed or? Oh, well, I had a, I had a phobia that was probably 80 years old. Uh, I had a lady that, uh, I mean, this one sticks in my mind. This lady, she was about 84 years old and she uh, had a severe phobia of thunderstorms. And this, this sweet little old lady would, she would turn into a different person. Her personality would change when a thunderstorm would, would be expected. And she would actually go down into the basement and hide in the closet until the thunderstorm was over. Ter terrible fear for 80 years. And so uh, I, I hypnotized her, deepened her, and I, I did an age regression with her. And she went back to being four years old walking across a field with her mother and there were fireworks going off and that was the initial sensitizing event the fireworks going off when she was four years old started her lifelong phobia of thunderstorms and so when when we got that the, the it was gone it was absolutely wow. gone no more phobia and and that was so incredible and it gives me chills when I think about this. So anyway, and then this lady was so happy that she sent, oh, she sent her whole family to see me. I, I saw, I saw her grand uh, grandchildren. Uh, I saw her, her children. I saw her nieces and nephews. I saw all these people because she was just my biggest advocate because I took away this fear that she'd had for 80 years. So that one kind of sticks in my mind. It's um, a really cool story. Think, because I'm just thinking that it's like, you helped solve in one session a problem that was compounded for 80 years. Yeah. It's like a, that's like an intense compounding. And just with one yeah. session that you can undo 80 years of comp like that's such a big convincer, actually. Yeah, it was it was crazy. And uh, but I think I think I mean some some of the cases stand out and some of the experiments stand out, but I think another one that I think about as being particularly meaningful is I worked with a lady who um, I, can't, I can't remember what it was. It could have been it could have been a weight loss session, but but there was there was something blocking her and, and in an age regression we and um, in in the hypnotherapy uh, we fixed a problem that she had had for years and years with her relationship with her mother. And at the end of this, or the next week, I saw her and she looks so different. That's another thing. You know, sometimes in the chair, when you, when you take care of this issue, you look at them, and you think, this doesn't look like the same person that came into my office. Their face changes. They just, it's incredible. And, and she, but she said to me, God, you, you changed my life. And I thought, wow, you know, you, you don't hear that very often. And no matter what you do, uh, it, hypnosis is a wonderful profession when people can say to you, you changed my life. And yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So that, yeah. that makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that giving a lot of fulfillment. Yeah. Right. Wow. Cool. Yeah. And um, talking about then uh, your whole career, like all these remarkable things, I'm also curious because we're going to hypnotize life. And I saw a, a poll that interested me so much. There was a poll like, do you think that in the future, AI therapists will take over uh, some mm. of the work of actual therapists? And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting question. And I'm curious, how do you see the future of hypnosis? Because you've seen it, I think, evolve from all these years. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. Um, 
I, I, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that we have no, uh, no standards. Um, I think that um, they're, they're, at least in the United States and, and in most of the countries I've visited, there are, are no, uh, there are no standards. Uh, you don't need to be licensed. And so anyone can call themselves a hypnotist or a hypnotherapist and the public doesn't know what they're getting. Yeah. Some of them, uh, some of them are very good and some of them are, are not very good at all. And you see this in every profession, right? You have this, this Delta, you have some people that are your peak performers and they are the best. They are, you know, they are the expert, the top of their field. And then you have some people at the other end and they're not very good. They're just barely okay. Um, and yes, that happens in every profession. However, if you have some standards and, and standards is not, that's an okay word, but there's another word I'm looking for. Um, but at any rate, uh, most professions or many professions have uh, a, a licensing program. And I mean, even if you can't even cut somebody's hair in most countries, unless you are licensed as a barber or a hairdresser, yeah. but in hypnosis, it's not required. And anybody can call themselves a hypnotist and anybody can do hypnotherapy. And, and because of that, that, that holds us back. I think uh, it, it, it holds hypnotherapy back from becoming mainstream because they're um, you, you don't know what you're getting. So that's, that's a problem. And I don't know how to fix that because I do know that if there was a true licensing program, I know that that, that brings up other problems. Yeah. Um, then you have the bureaucracy and if we were licensed, I'll bet it would not be from other hypnotists. It would probably be from psychologists or physicians. Mm -hmm. And then those of us who don't have a, a medical degree or who are not licensed mental health uh, providers will just get pushed out of the yeah. out of the profession, which means there will be a lot fewer people out there who, to actually help people. So it's a problem, and and so I'm I I don't know how we get around that problem, but but I think that's one of the major stumbling blocks in making hypnosis truly mainstream therapy. So I, I wish I had an answer for that, but I don't. Yeah, but. Yeah, I also like have similar thoughts as you about it. And uh, I especially what you say about, yeah, if if like psychologists would would uh, if you have to have a medical training, then a lot of people will be lost, myself included, because, well, I recently did actually a medical Thank training, you. to be honest. But uh, when I when we do the trainings and I have recently started doing the trainings, but we have different people. We have psychologists mm -hmm. the training, but sometimes we also have people with a completely different background doing the training. The training, mm -hmm. and I would not say that the psychologist necessarily would be the better hypnotist. Sometimes uh, you see people with a completely different background getting it more quickly or being more. Yeah, I don't know how to say that. So I, I wonder about it myself. Like, what is the best way to move forward? Because you don't want to lose those people i guess i wouldn't want to lose those people yeah no no and and i mean if one of the things that i've i've always thought about is that if if someone comes out a, a brand new psychologist or counselor that comes out of training and maybe they're 24 years old or something like that uh, but they have no life experience they they know they have the book learning you know how to treat certain things and of course their model is very different from our model you know, their model is uh, many, many sessions, dozens, possibly hundreds of sessions, right, to treat something. And but so you have this 24 year old, highly educated therapist with no life, uh, life experience. Or you could take some middle aged man or woman who has been through, you know, has raised a family, has 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 worked, has has experience in dealing with people over, say, 40 or 50 years. You know, who's who's going to make a better uh, hypnotist, you know, the one with the life experience or the one with the book learning who's very young and no life experience? I mean, it's. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think you can take it even further, Sean, I could say I could say who would make a better therapist for whom? 
because there's yes. also, like I feel like what you said like when people come to your office you're already friends like the rapport is so important and mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, like I cannot for myself speaking I cannot be a therapist for everybody because I mean you just don't always get along with everybody you know so you have certain right that's true with, with whom you resonate more or who you understand better because of your own lived experience so I can imagine mm -hmm. for um I don't know maybe younger people that uh, are going through some issues uh, in university that this young qualified therapist would be a great match yeah or or to work with children possibly yeah exactly. uh, I, I, I i know a couple of uh, younger hypnotherapists that that decided to specialize on working with children and they even got the little the little chairs for their office and and yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Of course, of course, an older therapist could be like a grandparent and work with a child. So that could work too. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's a very nuanced, uh, nuanced discussion, but uh, I uh, enjoy yeah. your thoughts about it. I would, be you know, and another thing that you mentioned, I, I just thought one other thing about uh, you, not every therapist being right for every client. Yeah. Also uh, people should not be afraid to refer people out to uh to their colleagues you know yeah. if you have someone and you just you don't seem to have that rapport um refer them to someone who with whom they may have better rapport and that's going to benefit the client as well sorry <laughs> yeah yeah i i was wondering if you see will there be new um developments within hypnosis that a new state is discovered or a new technique because usually what you see it's old stuff repackaged yeah yeah it's true um i don't know that we're going to see anything new it's this so there's so much old stuff it's so good yeah. that that people yeah. have forgotten about like for instance one of the things that i teach uh i taught this when i was in uh, germany last month uh was a dave elman technique to get rid of migraine headaches that he was doing back in the 1950s and the I, my colleagues are not doing it and i i don't remember if it, if it's if it's part of uh of the omni course but uh with elman it was a it was a desensitization and what he did was and i got this from an old elman recording and what he would do is he would have the person who experiences migraines to bring up a small headache and then snap his fingers and take it away and bring up a bigger headache and snap his fingers and take it away oh. and then eventually a big headache and then he would he would have them do whatever they're doing in their head to take it away. And I mean, I use this myself. I haven't had a headache in probably 14 years. I've not had a headache because of this technique. And and I just make my if I feel one coming on, I just make it go away. And so this is a Dave Elman technique that is 60, almost 70 years old. And mm -hmm people are not doing it. So, so there's so many super effective hypnotic techniques out there that if people were just using them, we wouldn't need any new techniques. Yeah. So, so I agree with you that um, there, there really is nothing new. Oh, but here, here's another thing. You got me started now. Uh, <laughs> here's, here's, here's another thing. There, there are many things that I used to believe about hypnosis that I no longer believe. And, um, I've been experimenting with the Esdale state and with somnambulism and trying to figure out, you know, what, what can and cannot be done. And like, for instance, now, uh Oh, this is blasphemy for an Omni, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> the, the Esdale state, I was always taught that don't bother doing suggestions in the Esdale state because people don't want to take suggestions in Esdale. Well, and I, I, I believe that. And, and so I never tried. And, and, but in my experiments, I have tried, well, here's the way it started. One of my students said, they don't take suggestions in Esdale. I said, no. And they said, so when you emerge them, how come they come out? And I thought, well, yeah, I guess that's a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah well, well, so anyway, yeah. so, so then I, so then I, I recently I started experimenting with Esdale and giving direct suggestions and they've been working just fine. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's it, there, there are so many things that I used to believe and, um, and now I no longer believe or I'm, I'm doubting. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of experiments. 
Great. Wow, that's wonderful. Yes, and then I think I have uh, many recordings of Dave Elman, and uh, it's a treasure trove, really a big treasure trove. Yeah. Yes. I'm yes, not so sure if they, like... if they still can be bought, purchased. I think somewhere in... Um, um, in it's west um, west um in the in the west side of the united states there's a publisher i think you can buy them there oh west westwood publishing yeah, that west, was run by yeah. gil boyne's organization yeah. Yeah, yeah they're they're um one of the distributors of hypnotherapy which is yeah. a wonderful hypnosis book yeah and uh also he did have some recordings of dave elman but but some of the recordings that was that was one of the good things because when um when i met the elmans and got them just you know to come into yeah you know, back into hypnosis, uh, people used to send them things and they still do. Hey, I've got this old recording of Dave Elman. Would you yeah. like it? And so these things have come in and uh, yeah, I mean, they're like, uh, do you teach, do you teach the catalyst induction, Elman's catalyst induction? No. Okay. That, I mean, I, I've, I've been teaching that and it's just, it's just, um, you know, I'm going to take three sips out of this water. Oh. When I take the first sip, your eyes get heavy and droopy yeah. and they want to close the second sip they, and the third sip they they close and they lock and and that was the one that i got such a kick out of it because you used to do it with a cigarette i'll take yeah. one drag of the cigarette <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and yeah i mean there's there's so many elman things that that uh, that are out there that have just been forgotten but i asked larry do you have somewhere a video and he said this should be but he has never been able to find any video recording of Dave Elman. No, unfortunately, no, that was uh, that would be yeah, awesome well, if we would have something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, if some if some video surfaces, it'll probably be probably be from the the television show Hobby Lobby, but okay. uh, but but um, I have not seen any video of that either. Just mm -hmm. just uh, audio recordings. Yeah, yeah, it's a pity. Okay, cool. Mm. I am looking at the time and I have to uh, start teaching again, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so nice to talk to you, Sean. I, I mean, I could talk uh, hours more to just uh, hear your stories. It's <laughs> such a joy. Yeah. So I, I oh, want to thank really, you. Yeah, I really want to thank you for taking the time. Is there anything last, any last words for this podcast you want to share? No, no, just uh, don't, don't keep chasing that course. Unless it's an Omni course, you can choose that. <laughs> I think that's the. I think that's a beautiful uh, summarizes the 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 talk very beautifully. So I thank right. you very well, much. Well, thank you, ladies, and I look forward to seeing you in Las Vegas. Yes, yes me too. Me too. <laughs>